Thank you, Vice President Collings, and I'm grateful to you to the hospitality of President Reese and Elder Gilbert today. Um, but before we begin, I just want to make sure that you've got the right guy here uh, this morning. Uh, <laughs> Because, you know, I once received an email inviting me to go on an all-expense trip down to Australia to talk about family life, you know, down under. And I was delighted to accept this offer to head uh, down to Australia. But after a few email exchanges, it became pretty clear that they wanted the BYU Brad and not the UVA Brad. So this morning you have the UVA Brad. I hope that we're okay with, with this option um, here. But no, seriously. It's a pleasure to be here at BYU. I know of no other university in the world that has as many talented scholars focusing on marriage and family. So it's really a tremendous honor here to be with you all this morning to talk about my new book, Get Married, Why Americans Must Defy the Elites, Forge Strong Families, and Save Civilization. Um, and this book is coming out um, on Valentine's Day, and so I encourage all of you here to <laughs> get one in time for the big holiday. Um, but seriously, I'm talking obviously about marriage this morning, and it's only appropriate that I begin with kind of some advice from my wife, Danielle, who said, you know, you need to start with this story for this BYU audience, okay? So this story, what's the story I'm talking about? Well, it's the King Midas story, okay? King Midas had a good life. He worked hard to protect his kingdom, was respected by his subjects, and loved his daughter. But it wasn't enough for him. He wasn't as popular, as powerful, as rich, as some of the other monarchs in Asia Minor. Midas wanted to stand out as a singularly successful sovereign. So one day he got a shot at his ambition. Dionysus, the god of wine, offered Midas one wish. He said, I want everything I touch to turn to gold, said King Midas. Are you sure, Midas, said Dionysus, this could end badly? But Midas answered in the affirmative. He got his wish. So he walked about his kingdom, turning everything that he could into gold. And at first, he was gleeful, thinking of all the riches and glory that would come his way. Midas started to daydream about taking his kingdom into the 21st century, and the New York Times profile and multi-million follower account on Instagram that would follow. But when Midas returned to his castle, he was in for some surprises. He tried to have a meal, but everything that he ate turned to gold. This got him worried. And then unbeknownst to him, his daughter came up behind him to give him a kiss on the head. And before he could warn her, she was turned into gold. So Midas realized that he had made a grave mistake. His beloved had been turned into a rock. Despair filled his heart. This power that he had sought with a kind of singular focus, Midas realized, was not a blessing, but a curse. Okay. So this ancient fable, I think, could not be more relevant for us in this day because the new elite messaging that we're often getting in the media, in the academy and online about work and freedom and family is advancing a kind of Midas mindset. This mindset discounts the importance of marriage and family. Fulfillment, we are told, is to be found in a rewarding career, in money, in freedom from the encumbrances of family life. In other words, it's about mammon over marriage. Take, for instance, this recent Bloomberg article that says that women who stay single and don't have kids are getting richer. Now, as it turns out, that's actually false. I'll talk about that more in a second. But the, you know, the implication here, right, is that, is that kind of it's career that's the kind of the path to prosperity, you know, not marriage and family. So you kind of should run away from marriage and family. But what's also interesting about this article was it is spotlighted a series of single and childless women um, in this article, who were to a woman, killing it. Women like Ashley Marrero, a 43-year-old professional who enjoys splitting her time between high-end properties in Manhattan and the Jersey Shore, and taking, quote, frequent travel for pleasure as well as work, who tells us that she could not be, as this quote here indicates, more fulfilled 
with her life. So the message that kind of came through in this Bloomberg article was, again, that money and work and freedom from family are the recipe for a prosperous and happy life for today's woman, okay? And this article from Bloomberg is by no means an outlier. We see, for instance, in The Atlantic, the case being made against marriage. We see, for instance, in The New York Times, kind of the case being made for divorce as kind of an act of radical self-love. So taken together, the messages we're getting from primarily left-leaning voices that dominate our mainstream organs of opinion is that marriage is often an obstacle to living your best life, particularly for women. Instead, you're supposed to live a life dedicated to radical self-love. Okay, so I think what I've said so far is not particularly newsworthy. I think we kind of all understand and appreciate here how much many of our organs of leading opinion are kind of making an anti-nuptial case in the public square. Again, kind of from the left. But we're now seeing kind of new voices emerging kind of from the right, what I call the red pill right. And this part of kind of the online right today is making the argument that number one, kind of men are oppressed and then kind of number two, that marriage is an obstacle for men flourishing, you know, in today's culture. I'm thinking here of online influencers like Pearl Davis and Andrew Tate, who are, again are telling us that marriage is a bad deal for men, given the risk of divorce in the contemporary world. Okay, so in the view, for instance, of Andrew Tate, he's probably the biggest voice in the online manosphere today, who's got more than 12 billion views on TikTok alone, Kind of this is how he talks about marriage. He says, quote, this. The problem is there is zero advantage to marriage in the Western world for a man, unquote. Especially because, quote, it's very common that women, unquote, divorce their husbands, okay? So from his perspective, any man in his right mind ought to stay single, make lots of money, and use but not invest in the opposite sex. This then is now the red pill right view of marriage. And so combined from both the left and the right, we're kind of getting this Midas mindset being articulated in different ways in today's culture. And this mindset is obviously kind of filtering down to a lot of young adults today, including young adults that I teach at the University of Virginia at UVA. Now let me be clear, my students are great, they're ambitious, they're hardworking, they're polite, they're engaged, but too many of them have been kind of captive or held captive by this Midas mindset. Take, for instance, the words of Holly, one of my recent graduates. She said this, quote, UVA students are definitely more focused on their education and getting their careers started than getting into a serious relationship. Basically, the thought process is relationships and love are a risk, but you always have your career and success to fall back on. So this kind of Midas mindset is not limited to UVA students. We're seeing kind of this perspective being articulated more and more by the general public. And it comes through, for instance, in polls from the Pew Research Center, you know, like this one, that basically is telling us that young adults, especially today, are according more importance to education, money, especially work, as kind of a source of fulfillment for them, rather than marriage and family life. So it kind of raises a question for us this morning. You know, what does the data say about this? And I'm gonna be careful here because I know we have got a statistician here in the form of President Reese. So I'm gonna be, you know, <laughs> careful with these stats here. But I also wanna say just as a side note here before I get into kind of the heart of the talk about that Bloomberg article, okay? completely off the mark, right? We can see here on the screens to my left and to my right, basically, that both women and men kind of heading into their retirement in their 50s, who are stably married about 10 times the assets as their single female and male peers. So there's just no question that kind of financially, you know, for the average American man and woman, you know, marriage is a much kind of better path to prosperity than staying single. Again, contra that uh, Bloomberg article. But I wanna underline again that there's much more to life um, than money. And so when it comes to sort of happiness, what we see is that yes, education, work, and money matter, but that marriage outpaces 
um, you know, these three pathways into happiness. And in particular, what we see in looking at what's called the general social survey, a leading social barometer, is that nothing compares to a good marriage for Americans, for men and women, when it comes to predicting their global life satisfaction. This figure here kind of gives us a sense of the GSS story here. And we're looking at thousands of adults across the US and the GSS. It's run by the University of Chicago. It's funded by the federal government. This is kind of like the, the gold standard for social barometers here in the US. So we can see here on the left is that yes, a college degree boosts your odds of happiness. Who's graduating this next spring? Just raise your hand here for a second. Okay, so you can look forward to a 64% boost in your happiness, you know. <laughs> Come, come spring, uh, we can see that yes, money is linked to more happiness here in yellow. Um, and yes, having a good, you know, a good job, a satisfying job here in red is linked to you know, more satisfaction. But just simply being married is a more powerful predictor of happiness for ordinary Americans. And then you can see here in green that nothing in the GSS, simply nothing compares to a good marriage and predicting happiness for ordinary Americans. And I've looked at other factors in the GSS. I've looked at sexual frequency. I've looked at self-rated health. I've looked at religious attendance. And there is no variable in the GSS that compares to a good marriage when it comes to predicting happiness. We can see in the next slide here that the odds of being very happy, to be more precise, with life increased by 545% for those who are in a good marriage, okay? So again, this runs kind of contra to the Midas mindset. And I think we can think here of the, the wisdom of Aristotle going back obviously centuries, who told us that we're social animals, right? And so our ties with others, our family members, our friends, end up being much more crucial to our welfare than how much money we have in the bank because these ties afford meaning and direction and a sense of solidarity. They give us opportunities to both care for others and be cared for by others. So it's these ties, not the priorities associated with the Midas mindset, that are most conducive to our happiness today in America. Now, the tragedy though of this moment, right, is that we're kind of living under a Midas curse, right? Where many of our biggest problems from falling rates of happiness, and seek happiness come down since 2000 in the GSS, to cratering fertility rates across the US, to the stagnant character of the American dream, arise from the fact that too few Americans are prioritizing, or frankly are able now, to successfully marry and have a family. This is kind of the Midas curse for our day and age. And we can see this in the statistics, with the marriage rate falling by about 65% here, and that may be kind of like a sort of a mystery stat for you this morning. Like, what does this mean that the marriage rate's falling by 65% since the year that I was born in 1970? What that means today, unfortunately, is that one in three young adults across this country we're now projecting will never marry. And we've never been in a demographic kind of moment like this where so many young adults uh, will not be marrying. And of course, there are many folks, not just in, in the media, but also in the academy, would say, no big deal, you know, NBD. But as I've been talking to ordinary adults across the country from my book, I am obviously not convinced that we should be nonplussed by this. So we can kind of consider, for instance, the story of Scott. Scott O'Sullivan is a guy who lives outside of the D.C. suburbs. And by the standards of today's culture, kind of by the Midas mindset, he should be perfectly happy. You know, he's in his mid-30s, he's got a college degree from Clemson, an engaging career as a military contractor, a house of his own, and a six-figure salary, okay? So he's doing well on the Midas mindset front. But these educational and these professional accomplishments are not enough for him. He said to me, quote, you know, I've got degrees on my wall, I've got accomplishments and certificates, but it doesn't mean anything in the end, he told me. It's not like I can take any of that with me after I die. O'Sullivan feels alone and at sea on many a day. Quote, I have to get up every day and look in the mirror and realize I'm alone. I have nobody. And he worries about the kind of fate that might await him if he should ever fall sick later in life. Quote, I have no help, you know. If something happened to me tomorrow, there'd be no one for me. Okay. So Scott is struggling with a mix 
toxic mix of loneliness, meaninglessness, and sadness. And I want to acknowledge, of course, there are many American adults who are single and flourishing. They're doing just fine. We heard about one, obviously, in Bloomberg. But there are also many more Scots out there today as the ranks of singles continue to mount in, in this country. And we can see in the next slide here, basically, that trends and unhappiness, these are two lines sort of charting out unhappiness in the GSS, are rising kind of the fastest among the unmarried Americans. They're in the top line here in recent years. And we're also seeing, too, from a new study from the University of Chicago that the decline in happiness that we're seeing come in the US since 2000 is explained most by the retreat from marriage in America. So again, the bad news this morning is that too many men and women are not able to kind of find their way to the altar. They're not able to kind of enjoy the meaning and direction and solidarity afforded by marriage you know, in this moment in our culture. So that's the bad news. Um, what's, what's the good news then this morning? Well, the good news this morning is that in looking at kind of marriage and family life across the US, I, I found four groups of Americans who are managing to forge strong and stable marriages that are generally happy most of the time. I've been married 28 years, and of course there are days, weeks, even months where things can be a little rough, right? But generally speaking, you know, people like myself are very happy with their marriages and with their lives. Um, and we're also thankfully stably married. So we're seeing in the data that Asian Americans, conservative Americans, religious Americans, what I call strivers, that's college educated folks like many of you will be in a few months or in a few years, are particularly likely to be succeeding um, at marriage today. And the question then is sort of what is their secret? And in the book, I identify five pillars for what I call family first marriages. And they're kind of basically five C's in the book. And those C's are communion, kind of a sense of a we before me approach to marriage. They are children kind of recognizing that your kids really depend upon you to have a good marriage, a stable marriage. They are commitment, recognizing the importance of things like fidelity and loyalty in marriage. Also cash, being practical about the importance of money in marriage. And finally, community, having people who are kind of with you and for you in your marriage is obviously extremely important. And if you were listening um, both to the introduction and then also to the first sort of slide, you'll kind of remember that I also kind of underline the importance of defining the elites when it comes to marriage. And that kind of subtitle has gotten a lot of questions on the internet. Even this morning, someone was responding to the BYU announcement, sort of questioning um, that subtitle. And the reason I talk about the importance of defining the elites in the book is we're getting more and more elite messages that are discounting these five C's in one way or another. So that's why we need to think about defining the elites, because they're often giving messages that are encouraging us to go in different directions than these five C's. So I'll talk today in the interest of time just about three C's, communion, commitment, and community. And in terms of communion, again, the idea here is you're trying to foster a we before me approach uh, to marriage. A we before me approach to marriage. And that can be contrasted with the way in which our elites are often kind of encouraging us to approach marriage. We often hear in the culture, you know, in the media and online, for instance, that we should be kind of taking a me-first approach to marriage, where we're kind of privileging our own autonomy, our own freedom, and our own self-interest. So practically, what am I talking about? We could think, for instance, about kind of money as one example of this. So there was a piece written by Carolyn Kitchener in The Atlantic that articulates a kind of me-first approach to money, kind of encouraging us to kind of keep separate accounts, a kind of his account and hers account um, in marriage. And her perspective articulating Atlantic is also paralleled by finance gurus like Susie Norman, who also kind of recommends that couples maintain separate accounts, okay? But as I've talked to ordinary couples across the United States, I got a different idea about marriage and money. And I'll just kind of tell you quickly about John and Marie Erickson. They're conservatives. 
They're in that group in, in the book. And when this couple was serving in the 82nd Airborne and they were engaged, they were getting ready to, to deploy to Iraq. And in prepping for their trip, Maria went to the store and got some items that were pretty expensive, including ballistic glasses. She said this, they were really expensive, something like $160, she recalled. And when she came back to you know, give these items to, to John, she made it clear that she wanted to be paid back for these glasses. But John in this moment just kissed her on the forehead and said to her, what is yours is mine and mine is yours, and now we're gonna be married and it's all equal. And this was the start of a we first approach to money that led quickly to a joint account once they were married. And this was a situation that benefited her because she brought college debt into their marriage and John did not. So they together <laughs> quickly paid off you know, this money. And she attributes this in part to kind of a virtuous cycle of you know, sharing and cooperation and trust that was, um, was good for her rock solid marriage to John. Okay? Now, they're not outliers. Okay? We can see in the, in the next slide here, um, I did a YouGov survey um, and found in the survey that couples who are pooling money are about you know, 20 percentage points, more like I said, they're very happy in their marriage, and almost 20 percentage points, more like I said, that they're not kind of considering um, divorce. And we see also in this research, um, in the broader academy, there's actually a random assignment done by scholars at Indiana University and their colleagues, and they took newlyweds and randomly assigned newlyweds to join accounts and then another group to separate accounts and then track them in the first two years of marriage. And I hate to tell you all if you're not yet married, but there is a little bit of a decline in happiness after the honeymoon for most couples, okay? But this decline was much smaller for couples who were randomly assigned to the joint accounts and more precipitous for couples who were randomly assigned to separate accounts. So again, kind of just even the practice of pooling money, of sort of forging this we before me approach to money um, was helpful in this experiment done at Indiana University, okay? So the broader point here, right, is the couples who take a we before me approach to marriage that's predicated on a sense of unity, teamwork, and mutual service are more likely to be flourishing today when it comes to marriage. So that's, that's the communion point. What about the kind of commitment point that we would see, um, you know, in, in the research and in my book? Again, what I'm suggesting to you today is that our elites are often encouraging us to sort of steer clear of these fundamental commitments, okay? Too often we're seeing our elites are telling us to kind of discount, for instance, the values of marital permanence and even the values of sexual fidelity in this current culture. We see, for instance, in a recent New York Times advice column that Philip Gallinet's was telling an older mom who was bringing her adult daughter to Greece that she should kind of make her peace with her daughter's polyamorous boyfriend. And Galanese was saying to her that he should kind of respect her daughter's choices, that she should read up on polyamory, and that she should kind of ad adapt a more open-minded approach to her daughter's boyfriend's approach to relationships. Now the point here, right, is that kind of this article is giving you a sense of sort of how often our elites are kind of discounting fundamental virtues and values related to things like sexual fidelity in marriage. This is kind of just one example of how this is playing out. But again, as I've talked to ordinary couples across the U.S., I get the sense that things like fidelity are pretty important um, in a successful marriage. You can think of, for instance, the story of Patrick Riley, who's neither actually not conservative and not religious, um, but he is a self-described family man, okay? And this tall, handsome, and well-spoken redhead who works in sales in Central Virginia is careful about protecting his marriage of more than 20 years. He meets a lot of people in his work. He plays guitar in a band in Virginia and travels a lot. All factors that could kind of boost his risk for infidelity. But he's intentional about protecting his marriage in real life. Quote, when I'm meeting new people in my line of work, I talk a lot about my wife and kids. I want them to know I'm a family man, said Patrick. He also has rules governing his online interactions. He says, quote, my wife is tagged in a majority of my posts. My status is listed as married. 
and interactions online are treated the same way as if in person. I do not follow old girlfriends as there is a reason they're in that category, okay? <laughs> so he's got, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Wise advice, right? So he's got kind of real fences and virtual fences that kind of are designed to protect his marriage. And I think these fences are one reason why his wife, Kelly, gives their marriage a 10 on a scale of one to 10, right? So again, kind of commitment ends up being pretty important. And we can see in the GSS here, for instance, that Americans who kind of take the classic view that any kind of infidelity is always wrong here in yellow are more likely to be happy in their marriage compared to Americans who don't subscribe to that classic understanding of fidelity. And then just more generally in the research on commitment and marriage, what we see is that in one actually very large study of more than 11,000 couples that the number one predictor of relationship quality for couples was the perception that your partner was committed to you. So again, kind of just giving you a sense of how much this value of commitment matters for strong and stable marriages in America today. Okay. And the final C this morning, getting closer to the end here, is community. Kind of understanding, appreciating how much it matters when it comes to su succeeding at marriage, to be surrounded by people who are with you and for you, you know, in your marriage. And again, we see from our elites oftentimes are messages that discount the importance of community, particularly one form of community, that is religious community, because they think that traditions and even tradition with a capital T are an obstacle to living your best life and realizing your best love. Okay, so what am, I, what am I talking about here? Well, let me give you kind of a concrete example that comes from one of our leading magazines, The New Yorker. They had an interview that was entitled this, A Sociologist of Religion on Protestants, Porn, and the Purity Industrial Complex. And it gave the sense that faith was bad for families. It was kind of built around an interview with the sociologist Sam Perry, and we're told by Perry that Christian men are afflicted by, quote, guilt and shame that makes them feel bad about themselves. That Christian women, quote, draw a hard line against pornography in ways that make them, quote, twice as likely to divorce their husbands because of pornography use, unquote. And that this benighted religious group has tried to establish, quote, a purity industrial complex made up of books and small groups and software companies designed to help Christian men avoid becoming addicted to pornography. So these efforts are painted by The New Yorker as quaintly quixotic at best, and at worst then as corrosively counterproductive. This is kind of the message we're getting. But as I interviewed ordinary couples across the US, I had a rather kind of different impression of the way in which sort of faith plays out in the lives of ordinary families. I'm thinking here, for instance, of the story of uh, Martin and Kimberly, who live in the uh, DC suburbs. And as Martin was talking about his approach to kind of marriage and some of these issues, he said this, he said, you know, I'm, I'm careful. It's one of those things where, you know, the Bible's very clear about fleeing temptation, he told me, adding. So yeah, certain sites uh, I won't go on, okay? So again, you can see how he's kind of relying upon his faith to sort of steer clear of the kinds of temptations that are being flagged by, uh, by the New Yorker. And actually we see in the research that yes, some religious men use pornography, but they're less likely than their secular peers to use pornography. That was kind of glossed over in the New Yorker, okay? Then what about Kimberly, his wife? She talked to me about how when she was younger, she was abused sexually by a family member, and this was obviously extremely hard for her, and even sort of hard for her as she entered into married life and you know, the intimacy that comes from married life. But this is what she said, that's how prayer entered, because I had some stuff happen prior to us that made having physical intimacy challenging for me. She's like, I'm like, okay, God, you're only gonna heal me. Only God can really, truly heal this, okay? So through the power of prayer and through the support of their friends uh, in their church community, they were able to kind of navigate these challenges and to forge a strong marriage. And again, Martin and Kimberly are not outliers. So what we see in the research here from this YouGov survey that I conducted with some colleagues is that people who attend church together are almost 20 percentage points more likely to be very happy in their marriages. Again, this is not the message you got from the New Yorker. 
We see in other work done by Tyler Vanderweel at Harvard that women, for instance, who attend church regularly are almost 50% less likely, it's in purple here, to get divorced. Okay, so faith and family tend to stabilize married life. And then when it comes to sex, again, this is completely glossed over in, in the New Yorker piece, couples who regularly attend church have more sex than their secular peers, kind of surprising given what the culture says to us. And they're also, as you can see here, more likely to be satisfied with their sexual lives compared to couples who don't have a church um, connection. Okay, so again, this is kind of not the message we're getting from the mainstream media oftentimes. Okay, so we can see then when it comes to religion that the family first values, virtues, and social networks supplied by religion typically strengthen and stabilize marriage in America today. Okay, so we've learned this morning that marriage in America is in retreat, in part because too many of our elites and now too many ordinary Americans have embraced a kind of Midas mindset. They're under the misimpression that life is about money, work, and me, me, me. But it's a big mistake to put mammon before marriage, as we've seen. And that's in part because nothing, for most of us, gives us a shot of that quintessentially American pursuit, the pursuit of happiness, like a good marriage and a strong family. The challenge then, facing us this morning, is to revive a kind of marriage mindset for the 21st century in our schools, in our colleges, on social media, in our churches and our homes. So every university in America needs a class like Jason Carroll's Marriage Prep. And every social media platform needs compelling new voices like yours that tell the truth about the most important social institution in winsome and powerful ways. In other words, you and I have to build a culture centered around the most important thing, which of course is not gold, but love. Thank you.